Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to 2016 SPUC conference. It's great to see you all here. I hope you had a good journey, and I hope you have a good weekend. I'm sure you will. Um, I'd like to uh, welcome on your behalf Mrs. Val Ward and Mrs. Angie Higginson, who are the president and Honorary Treasurer of the Union of Catholic Mothers. <coughs> We're delighted to see you. Thanks very much for coming. And Elspeth Chowdhury Best, who I think has just come in this moment, and Alan Smith, the co founders of this society that we're all proud to remember. Well. <laughs> we'll be hearing more about them uh, during the course of the weekend. Uh, I'd also like to uh, just point out to you the various stalls around here, which um, you may have already had a look at, but please, uh, over the weekend, do so. Uh, Paul, Lennon, Paul Lennon down here with the parliamentary stall, the image stall next to that, and Christine Fiddler, who is here, will be speaking um, later this weekend. SPC Evangelicals, and uh, Operation um, Mobilization, uh, which is next to the uh, Evangelical Stall. March for Life have a stall here. Good Council Network, uh, No Less Human, uh, Fiorella Nash selling her books. Um, and Fiorella has been a, a stalwart um, supporter of the society for many, many years. So please have a look at her books and get your money out and buy them. Uh, John Veer is, has a, a stall over there with 50 years of pro-life campaigning and very interesting to have a look at that as well when you get the chance. And don't forget the SPUC stall at the back, Christmas cards, literature, all the rest of it. Um, I'll try and mention these again during the course of the weekend. Um, I would also like to um, thank uh, many of our uh, speakers who are speaking this weekend, who are here already, arrived. Uh, Dr. Robert Wally is here, who's been in, involved with this society since 1970, I believe. My wife and I went to a, a rally in Liverpool in 1970, about then, and I seem to remember that uh, Dr. Wally was one of the speakers at that at Pier Head in Liverpool. So it's great that he's st still here now. Um, Isabel Vaughan Spruce and Helena Breen, March for Life, uh, welcome to you. Uh, Gail <coughs> Hendricks and Justina Pasek, Good Council Network, um, great to see you. Dr. Anka Maria. Chenia and Dr. Vincent and her, her husband, uh, Dr. Vincent Chenia, uh, Dr. Anka Maria will be speaking again tomorrow. Mary Dugan, I've seen here, Glasgow midwife. Um, Antonia Tully is here, will be speaking after breakfast tomorrow morning, which just gives me the opportunity to welcome, standing beside behind me, Mr. Paul Tully, who might be some relation with Antonia Tully. I was just going to give you some introductory remarks uh, about the conference generally and about the way things are going to go. So, Paul. Thank you very much. I, I relish this session. This is when it's my turn to nag. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> We're here to do the most important work on Earth. So. Let's be conscientious about it. Please try to be punctual. In that great pro-life and pro-family story, The Sound of Music, Maria Kutschura, Julie Andrews, I think you'll know her as, was castigated by the Benedictine nuns, um, at least in Rogers and Hammerstein's version of the story. They chided her with the line, she is always late for everything, except for every meal. <laughs> now, if Richard Rogers was writing the lyrics for our conference, I hope he'd write, 
try always to be prompt for everything, including every meal. Yeah. <laughs> I'd just like to ask you now to participate in this session by putting up your hand if you've been here before to a spot conference. Oh, that's lots of people. Now, everybody else gets a chance, those who haven't been here before. I see lots of big hands. There should be a few little hands. I can't see Gino Rogers' hand, can I? He's supposed to be here. He only arrived in the world eight weeks ago. Um, Joseph Jolliffe, I can't see him either. Only arrived seven weeks ago, I think it was. Maria Dooley? And they arrived six weeks ago. So they have an excuse for not having been to a SPUT conference before. The rest of you need to make up for lost time. So, um, but please do make a point of uh, uh, getting to know new people here. Um, if you need help during the conference weekend, you'll be able to identify staff if they're wearing their conference badge, which of course they all will be, um, because they'll have a green dot Staff have got a green spot. It's, it's not a disease. It's what's on their badge. <laughs> so you can identify them easily if you need if you need help. The tea and coffee breaks you'll see on your program um, are half an hour only. Now half an hour is quite a long time to drink a cup of tea or coffee, but we do have to trek down to the uh, the, the area near the dining room, uh, the, the reception area there, where tea and coffee. So, so um, please um, don't stand here chatting, chat en route with the people that you're going to, to fetch tea and coffee. Um, for those who may find it difficult to get down and up the slope in that time, please do um, feel free to bring coffee back here for people. It's, it's not a problem with, with bringing coffee back here or tea if, if you wish. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's easy to um, forget that others might need help. Um, you remember the story of the man by the pool at Bethesda um, who couldn't get in when the waters moved um, for the miracle he was hoping for. He'd been waiting where, there when the Lord asked him for 38 years. So let's, um, let's try and be a bit more attentive to the needs of those who, um, who need a bit of help with mobility. Um, there are new serving arrangements for meals here now since we were last here as an SBUC conference, which um, I hope you'll find uh, makes things easier um, for, for us uh, this time around. Uh, religious services are detailed on the back of the program. I should just point out um, that where it says Mass on your program, it means Mass in the vernacular, Mass in English. Um, the uh, and Latin Mass means Mass in Latin. Just to, be, just to be clear, when it simply says Mass, it'll be Mass in the, in the vernacular at those, at those times. Um, we're pleased to welcome um, our delegates and, and visitors and so on from various other organisations. Um, I'll just point out though, please, if you, need, um, if, if you want to make a, a public announcement about any other initiative that you're involved in or distribute um, literature, Please approach me or one of my SBUC colleagues. Um, we are happy, of course, as you can see from the presence of other groups around um, the hall and other delegates here to welcome initiatives that are compatible, um, but we do have to take responsibility for the, uh, uh, for, for the um, ideas and initiatives being promoted at, at the conference, so we would ask that courtesy if there are other things that you, um, that, that, that you want to promote as well. Um, one for the youngsters now, um, late in the evening, when you're rolling back to the accommodation block from the uh, uh, bar area especially, or wherever else, please keep noise to a minimum. The doors have door closers on, which make a loud slamming noise if you, if you allow them to. So please uh, try not to disturb others if you're coming back uh, when others have gone to bed. Um, the conference this weekend, we hope, will be uh, an occasion for publicity in your local media. Um, and we have uh, three of our uh, th three helpers to uh, spread that publicity for us. 
um, Isaac Spencer, who's, where's Isaac? Isaac's, uh, oh, he's in the booth at the back, waving at me. Um, Isaac's there, can't miss Isaac, tall and blonde. Um, <laughs> Alethea, who's, yes, Alethea's waving now. Alethea's not so tall and brunette. <laughs> um, but um, she will be sending out press releases. Uh, and Michael, who's here on my left, um, who's our photographer for the weekend. Um, there'll be an opportunity, um, uh, circumstances permitting, to have photos taken um, with the speakers um, or photos of your, um, your visiting um, group, your, your local SBUC group or other groups. So please make use of the time when you can in the breaks in, in conference um, to grab Michael and um, uh, and have a photo taken. We will then, um, through the good offices of uh, Isaac and Alethea, be able to get those photos to your local media. Um, they'll be being distributed principally by email and Dropbox. And if you want a hard copy, that can be provided, but it will take a little longer, as, as they say. Um, we, can, we can get them to you um, next week. So if there's anything you need, um, please do approach Spuck staff. Um, and uh, we'll be glad to try and help. And don't be afraid to talk to the other delegates too. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you very much, Paul. Can I just mention a mistake that I have made? Just the place. Yes. <laughs> Um, in not introducing myself to you, and I apologise for that, it's very arrogant of me, just assuming that you know who I am, but I won't do that again. My name is Robin Haig, I'm the Chairman of the Society, and it is I who welcome you all on behalf of the Society. That's what I should have said at the very beginning, as soon as I stood up. I've said it now. Anyway, going on to the programme that you have in front of you, our next session is uh, a welcome address by Dr. Anthony McCarthy, uh, who um, joined the staff two years ago, three years ago, five years ago. <laughs> <laughs> this Alzheimer's is just not good. Um, five years ago, uh, and um, his book is on the, uh, that he's written, publishes on the store back there. Please do buy it. Um, and I, without further ado, Anthony, I'll ask you to come and welcome our visitor. Our people. Well, thank you very much. Yes, I am the uh, SBUC Education Director, and it's a great honour to have been uh, trusted with that role. I, I hope I've uh, repaid that trust to some extent although the achievements of that department are very much down to others. Well, the new SPC website, which is very good, much improved, um, informs readers that in 1966, the date beloved of the world <coughs> football fans, two ordinary members of the public, Alan Smith and Elspeth Rhys Williams, now Charbury Best, had a conversation at the Wig and Pen Club in the Strand about forming a group to oppose David Steele's abortion bill, which had been presented in Parliament. Both of them are here today, on the 50th anniversary <coughs> of the foundation of the Society for the Protection of Unborn Children. And should you meet them, which I encourage you to do, uh, you'll find that they are two extraordinary people. <coughs> they won't now have a quiet weekend either. <laughs> Well, I found out that the Wigan Pen Club actually closed in 2003 and had an inscription uh, at that site, supposedly dating from 1625, with the blessing, Go thy way, eat thy bread with joy, and drink thy wine with a merry heart, for God approveth thy work. Well, that pub was mainly used by uh, greedy lawyers and drunken journalists, so I'm not sure <laughs> that that was a thing, but... These two certainly have had their work blessed with the growth of uh, the Society of Protective Unborn Children 
and uh, I think we owe them a round of applause. Of I'm going to be very brief because there's a, a lot of people I think you really should hear. But just to say, I was speaking with a colleague the other day and I was playing it was a 50 years celebration. And uh, this colleague said, um, well, yes, but we failed because what we're aiming for is our non-existence. Um, now, I don't think this particular colleague was proposing a mass suicide. Uh, <laughs> rather, the idea was that by repealing the 67 Abortion Act, and as it were, challenging the culture of death. It would be good if we could make the need for such organisations, such societies, uh, one that uh, no longer existed. And uh, that is perfectly true. Um, whilst we have much to celebrate, there is a sense in which we have failed. Um, but what we can celebrate mm. is the fact that there are thousands of babies, thousands of old people who have not been killed. Not just not died, but have actually not been killed by someone else. Someone who would be doing evil and moulding themselves in a particular way. And there have been numerous stories of conversion, of life blooming, <coughs> of families healed, of doctors rediscovering what it is they're here for. I know tomorrow we'll be hearing the extraordinary Rob Wally, who's uh, made enormous contributions in this area and inspired doctors, especially gynecologists, <coughs> people with particular care for women and the specialness of pregnancy, that sacred place where we all began our lives. So it is, of course, <coughs> a great joy that we have survived 50 years albeit with that caveat. Um, it's almost worth uh, buying a new suit for. But uh, it is, I think, Spock's achievement that it has remained, and I, I, now more than ever perhaps, consistent in defending every single life. Not screening out certain lives that are inconvenient in the name of political convenience, but actually trying always to attend in ourselves the temptation, the temptation in ourselves, I certainly have it myself, of dismissing certain people that are inconvenient. On the contrary, what you need is an organisation to inspire people and to remind us to resist those <laughs> things, which even if they're in ourselves, are in others, even more strongly, who may not have many of the advantages that we have, who may not know the people that we are. So, we face a culture of death, and the term has almost become a bit of a cliché, but a culture of death, to me, simply means a culture where institutions, people, the polity, people's own hearts, their dispositions, their intentions, allow for the idea that you can kill the innocent for convenience in certain circumstances. And they might say, well, it's only very few circumstances. So it's a tiny circumstance. So I'm very similar to you. But you're not very similar in some ways because you have removed the idea of an absolute, a moral absolute, which is the only protection of the weak. The weak are only protected by the moral law. Moral law that all of us have access to, all of us can understand. I think all of us, pretty much all of us in our hearts, know it's true. Now, those that are strong or in positions of power are perhaps not interested in that moral law, want to remove it. And people think that they're free if they step outside from that law and forget about human dignity, that that's freedom. But of course, it's the opposite of freedom. It is the removal of the protection of the weakest. And I certainly found in, in, in joining Spark, and I was aware of Spark from quite a young age, although I was not actively involved. But I knew Spark, whatever problems 
there might be, or conflict and disagreements people might have, Spock basically stuck to that. It didn't water down, it didn't mess around, and I think that that is the thing that will ultimately sustain us. The other thing that will sustain us is, and we have to say this, young people. Um, and I am very pleased now to be able to introduce four interns who have been nurtured under my colleague Ross and Thomas's extraordinary guidance um, to work with Buck, to inspire people and to get out in the streets and do, in a sense, campaign for that, uh, sorry, or rather make real the idea that there are moral absolutes and that human life is sacred. So I'm going to welcome, uh, I'll do it by name, Amber, Jenny, <laughs> Alanis, and Alejandro. Abortions, 
and what we did was we went around the houses in the area and to inform people that there were abortions taking place and that those abortions the people in the clinic were targeting Polish people because a lot of them had been coming over to England because the laws are more restrictive in Poland or just they were living in the area and thank God um, a lot of people were actually astounded by this and they they did say that they would actually do something against it but what was quite terrifying was that a lot of them had no idea that this abortion clinic uh, was there and moreover that it was a private abortion clinic and that they were charging £400 per abortion so actually making a profit from making women and, and suffer and killing their children. Uh, whilst working for Spuck, we spent a lot of the time going from door to door in Tuting and we would distribute leaflets to, to the people when they opened the door and just tell them about, uh, make them aware of what was going on. And we also did a pro-life vigil, which was organised by the brilliant and lovely Rosalind Thomas. Um, every, <laughs> every last Saturday of the month. Um, and we, I did actually see that a lot of people took notice and some people even agreed to um, perhaps in the future participate in them. Um, yes, as you can see, sadly, um, I promise I was praying. Um, <laughs> just at that point, I was just a tiny bit distracted. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyhow, um, right, uh, we can just move on to the next slide. No, is that the last one? The administration and reading, something which is definitely uh, very important um, when you're working with SPUC because you have to do a lot of administrative work which sometimes um, I myself had just thought of SPUC, you know, um, going out, campaigning and I hadn't, I hadn't thought at all about the, <laughs> about the work that goes on behind the scenes um, and how hard people work behind the scenes doing tons of folding and filing to actually get all of the pro-life literature across. Sorry, I'm actually thinking a long time. I apologise for that. Um, anyhow, as part of our everyday uh, internship, uh, as part of our internship, every day we did an hour of reading uh, in order to increase our knowledge of the, well, a range of topics, a range of pro-life topics, so that we could um, be much better at advocating the product cause. So we were very lucky to have Anthony Riccardi um, to help us improve our ability to debate. We actually had a one-on-one um, -on -one where we debated about things and he was actually pretty good at shutting us down. <laughs> <laughs> but we improved, we're improving. So. Um, um, Thanks to Roslyn and some of the Spuck staff, we had an amazing array of literature prepared uh, for us to read up to increase our knowledge of the pro-life arguments. We also got help with the important administrative work behind the scenes. Um, and well, to wrap up, I would just like to say that well, I prepared something. Yeah. Um, I just want to remind everyone that just over a hundred years ago, our country and several others were involved in one of the most bloody wars that the world had ever seen, the First World War. And over 11 million military personnel, over 7 million civilians uh, were killed, not to mention the 20 million people who were wounded. Just over 20 years later after that, uh, again the world saw an even more horrendous war, the Second World War. Uh, in it between 50 million and 80 million people were killed. However, the more terrifying fact was that approximately half of those people were civilians. Uh, the war had brought deaths to our towns and cities that ne had never experienced such chaos to such an extent. However, now we face a much more terrible and devastating crisis. 
Sadly, we have lost 6.7 million children in Britain since the passing of the Abortion Act in 1967. From 1980 to today, um, worldwide, there have been over 1,427,627,000 children aborted. We want to stop abortion, and we know that all of you do too, young and old, and we appreciate all of the work that you put in, and we thank you very much just for being here. And we hope that we, in our small way, may help you to become stronger advocates for the pro-life cause. We would like to thank all of, us, all of SPUC for this amazing opportunity, and all of you uh, for your support and efforts. The battle for the protection of human life is ongoing and of utmost importance, and we need to remain always positive and motivated because with every small action that we do, you are saving human lives and you're converting people. So, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much indeed. And I should say, uh, the, in the interns you've had this year they always are extraordinary. Uh, we learn from them uh, as well as them learning from us and uh, to see that passion uh, for the cause you know, at such a young age is, is always uh, inspiring. Now, the person who did most of the work uh, uh, in, in guiding the interns was of course Rosalind Thomas who I think will be known to many of you. Um, I'm not allowed to compliment her because she says that's very embarrassing. So. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but she has obviously been known to the society, has uh, done extraordinary work. She's a campaigner, uh, she's uh, constantly finding new ways in which to challenge the culture of death uh, <coughs> at every level. And that's an extraordinary um, ability, um, and it's something we need to take very seriously. Um, she, of course, comes from uh, people we know very well. Her, her older sister, Janet Thomas, who's uh, brilliant and lovely, is uh, there. She's been leading. Um, no less human for many years, so this was a key part of uh, some things I was talking about earlier, about remembering the disabled. Uh, some of you may remember Alison Davis and uh, Colin Hart uh, still have carried on this extraordinary work, and it carries on both uh, with Janet, but also uh, some of Rosalind's work. So, Rosalind. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to point out that the um, disability part of the talk is going to come later on with um, Chris, Mary and Maria Brennan. Um, although my job title is a uh, youth officer, I get to work on a wide range of projects, uh, projects that is. Last December uh, I moved into a new area of London. It's not a particularly nice area, uh, but there are certain things I thought I would like about it like the fact that there are lots of good communities there. There are Carolans and Sri Lankans, Poles and other people. Unfortunately, a couple of weeks after I moved in, as Alejandro pointed out, I found out something awful about the Polish Medical Centre, uh, which I pass every day and which I thought was a good family centre. I found out that this medical centre, literally less than a two minute walk away from my flat, aborts sunborn babies up to nine weeks, amongst other anti-life procedures such as IVF, as well as a big emphasis on so-called sexual health services. And this is something that I am reminded of every day when I go to work and when I come back from work. Since January of this year, I have been trying to convince the local Polish priests at a very large Polish parish about two miles away from this medical centre to oppose this centre and to help with our campaign. This has been a very difficult process um, with lots of setbacks, but we've actually just reached a turning point um, and it's a real answer to prayer what is happening right now. And I would ask you to continue to pray for this project. 
It's very heartening that the Polish Catholic Bishops' Conference have launched a campaign to completely abolish abortion in Poland. We also have Polish activists in this country who play a vital role in the pro-life battle. And I actually couldn't have done um, this campaign at all had I not had the help of two Polish girls who were twins who translated all the leaflets for me and just done so much work. Nonetheless, I consider the Polish community in the UK to be a sleeping giant. What could be achieved if all the pro-life polls in the UK joined the pro-life movement? Furthermore, it should scare us that members of the Polish community, which is usually so faith-filled, have sunk to the depths of killing their own unborn children. It proves that no group in society is safe from the scourge of abortion and that we must all be vigilant. Thankfully, a separate uh, Polish medical centre in the same area have been very supportive of our campaign and we will be working closely with them. Indeed, their resident gynaecologist is pro-life and they will be displaying our leaflets to raise awareness of the abortions happening at the other medical centre in Tooting. They're also very keen to promote the pro-life message in general through both Polish and English leaflets at their clinic. Our own GP surgery's abortion leaflet has just been translated into Polish by my Polish friend and is going to be distributed at their clinic. However, I do worry that in the pro-life movement, sorry, in the pro-life movement, we've come to assume that our own families and close friends will be pro-life just like we assume that Polish people are pro-life, or at least we assume that our friends and families won't have an abortion anyway. However, <coughs> as the Irish found out in the run-up to their referendum on same-sex marriage, nobody can rely on coming from a good family or having pro-life parents. People have to know and believe in traditional values, like they believe in the existence of the ground under their feet. They have to know and understand why these values are a reality, not just a belief. They have, they have to grasp that there is no personal truth. There is only the truth, and that stands no matter what your friends believe or how convenient it might be to change your mind. Some people tell me that they don't want to impose their views on their children. Or perhaps they feel their children or grandchildren are already lost and they can't persuade them to be pro-life. <coughs> the problem is that the scourge of abortion won't leave your family untouched just because you don't talk about it. Unfortunately, even very active pro-lifers have been through the pain of knowing that their grandchildren and their great-grandchildren have been aborted. Is this an acceptable cost of our silence? Earlier on, we heard from our four interns who were with us this summer. This is the sort of person that we need. People who are willing to give up some creature comforts, to be unpopular, to do things which are not enjoyable because they can see the end goal. We also need young people who realise that they are young, that they are inexperienced. They don't come to be interns because they know it all, but because they don't know it all and need and want to learn. Today we're supposed to believe it's all about young people. And I'm not saying that's not true, but there's definitely more to it than that. It's true that the future does lie with young people, in the sense that if anyone's going to continue the pro-life movement, it will be them. But those young people will never come to be a part of the movement if they are not convinced of the need to do so. And since the best way to lead is by example, the future necessarily involves every generation, since we all need to act. I have come to believe that children, teenagers and young adults do not believe in the pro-life argument or are not sufficiently convinced of it to act, partly because older generations believe and tell young people that the youth of today know best, that all their opinions are valid, and that everything is up for discussion. 
Where is the leadership in their social education? Why are we surprised when they go off the rails and throw traditional morals out the window? We have actually encouraged them to do so by not educating them in the truth. Without leaders, it's easy to flounder. A few months ago, I had my worst school presentation ever. It actually took me a few days and a lengthy pep talk from my mum to get over it. During the Q&A, they were shouting at me. Some of them walked out and they applauded each other, sorry, they applauded each other when they made rude and ridiculous statements. They were out of control and there were teachers in the room. One boy actually said to me, and these were his actual words, he said, I'm bright, you should listen to me. <laughs> As he told me how unscientific the pro-life argument is. And I asked him to repeat himself, and he did. And why shouldn't he say that? Indeed, at the end of the session, the teacher actually thanked him for voicing their opinions. Apparently, as long as you're expressing an opinion, it's okay. Never mind that they had behaved appallingly. Are we so different, though? So often, I hear people say that they're too old to do anything. Young people know what to do, it's up to them. This is the message they receive time and time again in the modern world, and now we're hearing it in the pro-life movement, too. This attitude disregards the huge wealth of experience and knowledge that lies with those people who have been doing pro-life work for as many as 50 years. It makes those people feel worthless and out of date. What is your contribution worth? You're old, you don't matter anymore. In fact, the opposite is true. <coughs> Everyone has a huge amount to offer but it's a particularly pernicious lie to say that the elderly are of no use anymore. Even if you can't move from your house, even if you can't move from your chair, everyone can pray for an end to abortion. Everyone can write a letter. Even if you can't write it yourself, you could dictate it to someone. One of our long-standing members, Anne Farmer, who is practically housebound, is famous for her pro-life letters which are published in the Daily Telegraph and elsewhere on a regular basis. How many lives has she saved with her pithy words? You may remember that September 2015's issue of the Pro-Life Times featured our eldest member, Mr Archie Murdoch, who died on the 29th of June this year. May he rest in peace. Right up until his death, he was writing letters on behalf of the weak and defenceless. Jean-Dominique Bobby, the ex-editor of French Elle magazine, who was completely paralysed except for his left eye, wrote his world-famous book, The Diving Bell and the Butterfly, just by blinking with, yes, his left eye. He didn't even have two eyes to blink with, just one. <laughs> For this reason, we showed this film to our young people at the youth conference last year, and if you haven't read the book or seen the film, I would recommend it to you. It makes me want to weep with frustration when handing out leaflets, when so many of the elderly people say they have no use of it. I ask them if they have children, grandchildren, or if they even know anyone on their road who is not pro-life. Do they not know anyone who needs to hear the pro-life argument? No one at all. When we promote this dangerous attitude, even in the pro-life movement, is it any surprise that there is such support for euthanasia in wider society, that, el that the elderly prefer lethal injection to feeling useless and unwanted in their old age? Of course, we know that young people really do have amazing potential which is why SPUC has an internship programme and a youth conference and university speaker tours and school talks and a youth officer, that's me. Young people are important, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that. 
Nonetheless, some of their ideas can be played wrong, just like some of us, uh, just like all of us will have ideas that are plain wrong. And everybody needs to be taught and to receive instruction. When I think back to two and a half years ago, when I first started this job at the age of 25, I cringe at the mistakes I made, and I still cringe at the mistakes I make. I had never managed interns before, for example. I had lots of experience in the pro-life movement, but I needed guidance from people like Dr. Anthony McCarthy, or else I would have been clueless. Maybe I still am clueless, I don't know. Worst of all, I think, is the effect this attitude has on young people who are so eager to do pro-life work, like the young people we just heard from. It's incredibly draining and depressing to see whole swathes of older people who have given up on the pro-life cause. Trying to motivate people who think you are fighting a pointless battle is like carrying a dead weight around with you. It makes you want to give up and you wonder why you even bothered at all. For those young pro-lifers, older people are also vital in transmitting to them the hard-earned lessons of the past. It's very sad to see up-and-coming pro-lifers in the UK and abroad supporting legislation which would discriminate against the disabled and those conceived in rape and incest because they believe it's the only way to abolish abortion. Clearly, they've not been taught the lessons which stuck and so many others learned when Lord Alton's bill went horribly wrong and led to abortion up to birth for those with disabilities. And we really need to learn that lesson. I hope that those pursuing these strategies don't cause a similar catastrophic change in legislation in the future. Chesterton put it perfectly when he said, Men do not differ much about what they will call evils. They differ enormously about what evils they will call excusable. I believe that many of, the pro uh, many of the problems we have today with waning local branches, rogue pro-life ideas being rebranded as the way forward again, and in many cases, anti-life and anti-family beliefs springing up, even in pro-life families, are partly because some people in older generations have convinced themselves that they are of no worth, and partly because we have made a golden calf of youth. Of course, these problems are two sides of the same coin. Please let me repeat this. The youth of today need leaders, and sometimes leading means pushing, and sometimes leading means saying no, and sometimes leading means taking people down a peg or two, because nobody knows all the answers at the tender age of 18, 19 or 20. Indeed, we all need to be taken down a peg or two sometimes, including myself. This applies not only to the structures which exist in the pro-life movement, but also, if I may say so, though I don't have any children of my own, in the home. Without solid pro-life families who taught them that it was their duty to do pro-life work, most of our interns would not be here today. And I want to repeat what a blessing the interns have been this summer and how fortunate we are to have had them. Next, you will hear from Chris, Mary, and Maria Brennan, discussing, who will be discussing disability, which is a topic which is more important than ever today. Many people like to harp on about equality and rights, and the Paralympics are promoted to some extent, although it's obvious that they were considered to be far less important than the Olympics. But the fact is that disability is amongst the most accepted reasons for, abo for aborting a baby particularly if you're aborting a baby at a later stage in pregnancy. So I'm so glad that they'll be speaking with us this evening. I hope what I've said has been useful to you. Thank you very much for listening. Good evening everyone, uh, my name is Chris Brenner and this is my daughter Maria 
and uh, my wife and Maria's mother, Mary, is sitting in the front row. She doesn't want to be on stage any longer than she has to be. So we're going to kick off. <clears throat> um, we're, both, we're all living in Bristol. Uh, we've been members of SPUC, at least Mary and I have, for many, many years. Um, I'm currently the acting chair and secretary of uh, SPUC Bristol, and I also led the East Kent Thanet group for many years before we moved to Bristol in 2002. I'm married to Mary, as I've already said. We have six children, the youngest of whom is Maria here. And she's going to talk to you uh, about the things she, she does uh, day to day in her life. But first of all, I'll ask her just to uh, introduce herself. I hope you can hear her. She's going to speak up nice and no, I'm Maria, and I live at home with my mum and my dad. I have four brothers, one sister, Catherine, who lives, lives in Bristol. My brothers live in Yorkshire, Berkshire, Birmingham and London. I have lots of spark friends and I am very happy to be at this year's conference. In this short, short talk, the three of us plan to give you an insight into our life together from the perspective of parents and from Maria's viewpoint. We do this against the background of a generally positive change in society's attitudes towards disability during Maria's 29 years of life. In, contra in contrast to the increasing discrimination towards unborn disabled or potentially disabled babies in the womb. I was born on 3rd of March 1987 in Margate Hospital. I went to St. Elphaba's Catholic Primary School in Ramsgate. I made very good friends with a girl called Grace, who is still my friend. Grace is now a special needs teacher at a school in Bangkok, Thailand. My secondary school was at Ursuline College in Westgate, Kent, where I had a very good class assistant. When I was 15, we moved to Bristol and I went to a special school until I was 18. Then I took a year out before going to college. During that year, I went on a catering training course. Then went to Australia to do eight weeks work experience on a friend's farm in New South Wales. A special job on the farm was to feed the hens and collect the eggs. They called the hen chucks over there. <laughs> <laughs> they had lots of dogs, which I was quite frightened of, of at first. Their names were Red, Blue and Bumpty. For five years, I studied at City of Bristol College to help me to become more independent. One very special thing I did was to learn to travel on the buses. Now with my bus pass, I can go to lots of places on my own. Finally, I did a long year, a long, a year long project search work program with Bristol City Council. Here's the YouTube that did about my work. To come into work, and I think from the organisation's point of view, encouraging working with the grain that's really important. This project absolutely fits into that. So finding ways of helping people with disability learning difficulties in this case, to find a place in this organisation. And we took that seriously here in our own team management team at Council. We had Maria come to stay with us for about six or seven weeks, and it was interesting to see how she developed over that time. I work in a office, new chief executive's office. get here about eight, I mean, I get here at about nine, nine o'clock, and I leave about four, four o'clock. I work in the office 
do my job and other new skills such as working on computers. First I come to the classroom to do some work and I go to the office and do my job. Filling the vending machine, asking to do tea and coffees, I did a post and log, post onto the computers. Oh, my favourite task is shredding. <laughs> it gives my colleagues time to do the work by themselves. We have been learning a new working. We have been learning that working as a team. I like them much better as a creative activity. I have learned how to act professionally, professionally at work. I would like to do a paid job. I thought it sounded like a great project and a great opportunity for young adults with learning difficulties and I've got to be a part of that. Have an hour actually undertaken the project. I think it's brilliant. Having lots of young adults and giving them the support they need to access future employment, which previously they did not have that opportunity.
or another option could be living with a family, um, sharing a family's home. And in Bristol, this particular scheme is called um, Shared Lives. In the meantime, Maria goes to another family for three days every month. And she loves doing this as she gets on very well with the family. And this provides a new experience, both for her and provides some respite for us. And she also has regular days when she spends time with a, another carer, or a personal assistant as they are called, um, who she considers to be her friends. She has two different carers. Um, she mentioned a lady called Jo in her talk. She's a very lively young woman and she takes Maria out and when she brings Maria back home again six hours later she tells me that Maria is very tired because I haven't stopped talking for the previous six hours. <laughs> so they obviously have a wonderful time together. Yeah. Um, I would like to say a few words about carers, particularly older carers. Um, recently I was part of a forum for carers with Bristol, working with Bristol City Council. And here I met a number of people who were struggling to continue with their caring role, both because of their age and because of cuts to local authority support um, for people with learning difficulties, which I think we're all aware of that the cuts from the central government to local authority have been cut, have been um, have gone deeper. So, for example, a much-loved respite care facility in Bristol was closed in order to save money, and it was sorely missed by the families who had used it for many years. Um, So I would like to make a plea, actually. Um, if you know of a disabled person in your neighbourhood, or parish, or other group, please consider whether you can reach out in some way to befriend that person or support their family. Maybe just by saying hello. At first, you may not get much reaction, but please persist in a gentle way. It is, of course, the nature of a person with a learning difficulty that it takes time for them to process what you are asking them or comments that you are making. So you would need to make it as simple as possible. One of the biggest lessons that I have learned in raising Maria was the need to slow down, to both slow down my thinking and my reactions to things and to also give her time Listen. Unless you slow down and listen, you may never get a response. I'm aware how difficult slowing down is in our sometimes frenetically busy lives, but the rewards of doing so can be immense. We are fortunate in that our older children are all settled in their lives, busy though they are. We now have great ten grandchildren. So they keep in touch and they see Maria whenever they can. She's had some very happy times with her nephews and nieces. With Maria, her time living with us has been greatly extended, inevitably due to her greater needs. In the normal course of events, children grow up and leave home, either for work or to go to university or to marry, this is not the case for a young person with Down syndrome. Maria has lived with us up to now, but at the same time, we've tried to foster her independence as much as possible, which again was the main aim of the college courses that she did. We've come across some wonderfully dedicated professionals, college tutors, learning support assistants, and social workers whose work has been an inspiration to us. Also, we have received much support from the SPUC Handicap Division, as it used to be called, 
now the no less human division, particularly Alison Davis, who sadly is no longer with us. And now we very much appreciate the continuing work done by Janet, <coughs> um, Janet Thomas. Um, at the 1990 SPUC conference, we were very lucky to meet Professor Jerome Lejeune, who delivered an extremely moving talk about his work with Down syndrome babies and the research he had done on the condition. And we were even more lucky to visit him in his hospital in Paris the following year, where he gave Maria a, a, um, a consultation. And uh, this was all through our links with Spuck. Um, before I hand over, oh, I, I guess I wanted to thank Spuck very much for all that you have done to value and respect disabled people. Through the no less human division, you have given such people an effective voice. Before I hand over to Chris um, to conclude, um, I wanted to say that I recently heard um, an actress on a Radio 4 programme. Um, her name was Sally, Sally Phillips. Um, and she said, um, Down syndrome people are very good at love and being human and human interaction. It was so exhilarating for me to hear something positive and so true on the media. And I'm just asking now, are these really the people we are trying to screen out of our society? I believe there is a TV programme coming up called A World Without Down Syndrome in October, but I don't have any more details about it at the moment. So now, if I hand over to Chris to conclude our presentation. Thank you, Ron, running a brief half a minute. Uh, I said at the outset that there has been a generally positive change in society's attitude towards disability, but there's still lots to be done, particularly in the area of, of, of employment. Despite all our efforts, paid unemployment for, for Maria has not been forthcoming. And who knows, maybe there should be legislation to encourage employers to do more. In my view, only when people with disabilities are fully integrated into society will the appalling discrimination against disabled babies in the womb be stopped. Thank you very much. experiencing that school with the people being unkind and rude to her and shouting at her and so on. It reminds me that this is a battle. It's a battle, whether we like it or not. We just have to keep on. We have to keep on in that battle, in that fight. Um, and Maria, fantastic story. I remember Maria. I remember Mary and Chris when Maria was born, when she was a baby. Um, and watching her over the years is fantastic. 
I just want to add, uh, uh, to give you a, a personal experience, um, I have an older brother who was born with, um, I don't think, well, he has learning difficulties now. I think possibly at the time he was born, which was in the 1940s, there may have been some problem with his birth and that's what caused it. And my mother, in that, you can imagine in the 40s and 50s and 60s, it was sort of shameful almost to have a disabled child. And my mother, like Mary, was very concerned about how this um, man, as he became, as he is now, um, would be looked after after she got. In fact, she died quite young, about 1972, when she was about 59, I think. And he, at that time, he was in a home, in an institution. Margaret Thatcher came along, caring the community, close all these institutions, get people out into the, into the real world, say, ones who are very seriously ill. And this, for my brother Malcolm, has been a fantastic experience. It's the most a wonderful, liberating uh, experience for him. And he's lived for about mm, 25 or 30 years in a house with two other men, similar uh, situation. So I just I give that as an encouragement, <clears throat> the worries that you have, and anybody else who's thinking, you know, what do we do about my relative who's got problems in whatever way. Mm. We can do it. Whether we do is up to us, but human beings can do it if um, we're forced to. So thank you again to all those things. I guess we have a bit of time now. Is there anybody who would like to ask any questions to any of the people who've spoken this evening? Um, yes, I, I'd like to ask a question of Rosalind, if she'd like to. Um, Rosalind actually trained me as a speaker to go into schools. And I'm sure she would agree that the two areas that present the greatest difficulty are abortion after rape and abortion of babies who are deformed. And it just seems to me that the lecture material, which contains, as I'm sure many of you are aware, some very good video footage, uh, should also include footage of people who have suffered from disability. Um, I was a barrister for 45 years, and one of my colleagues suffered from cystic fibrosis. And the early prognosis was that she wouldn't survive her teenage. She lived to 49. She became a barrister. She became a criminal barrister, and I can tell you that it, it is very hard work. And with all her disabilities, she was a great success. And if there was footage of someone like that in the lecture material, it would help to answer <coughs> the cynicism that one meets when one presents the argument on disability. Mm. I agree that um, we need to, well, nowadays because there is uh, so many abortions for disability, I feel that people are not seeing disabled people very much in society. Um, I don't know if you've ever been to a country where um, abortion is illegal or where uh, there are far fewer abortions. I remember one time I was in Tunisia and I felt like I was seeing people with Down syndrome everywhere. But I wasn't. I think I was just seeing a normal number of people with Down syndrome who weren't being aborted. And it was wonderful. Um, and people didn't treat them differently. They were just members of society because that's what people with Down syndrome are, just people just like anybody else. And that was great. It was great to see that. And there were loads of people, people in wheelchairs, all, all that sort of thing. Yeah, I, I do definitely think that um, we need to change that. Um, Tom Rogers has just joined SPUC and he is working on um, updating the education 
uh, talk uh, this autumn. Uh, yeah, I think we do need to include things like that. Um, I think we also have we have the Q and A because it's difficult to to uh, cover everything in the talk, especially because we're often very limited. You know, as you know, you've delivered the talk yourself, and we know that we're very limited in terms of the time that we're given in school. So the Q and A often provides um, time to cover those those questions. Uh, but yes, I, I do definitely think that we need uh, more of that in society. Um, the person who leads um, Not Dead Yet, is it, um, I think her last name is Carr? Yeah, Liz Carr, that's correct, yeah, Liz Carr. She's an actress, she's a wonderful example of, um, I think, was she on Silent Witness, is yeah. that correct? Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, so she's, a, she's an amazing example of somebody, she's a comedian, she's hilarious, she's... Uh, she does a lot. We need people like that, but we also have to face the fact that we can't cover everything in our talk. We try our best, but we try to cover little bits of everything. But you know, also we have to face the fact that the Q and A is also a time when we have to face those questions uh, as well. Um, but also, I think being realistic about disability is good. Um, I, I mean, personally, it annoys me when we have to say that okay, everybody with a disability has to be happy all the time, but people with disabilities have a right to be unhappy as well, and they have moody days, just like everybody has moody days. So being realistic about disability is also good, I think. Well, with respect, um, I don't really agree with the gentleman who last spoke, because we shouldn't be, we shouldn't have to upset disabled people, people with learning difficulties, for their achievements. Nobody has to achieve anything. Everybody has their own dignity. And it, it, it concerns me a little bit, and has been over the years, having been um, involved in a family with a, actually a Down syndrome sister, and working in the Catholic Fellowship, um, which used to be called for the Handicapped or the Handicapped Children's Fellowship. Now, of course, that's not politically correct, so just call the Catholic Fellowship. But, um, you know, there's so many children, disabled, um, with difficulties, who are not going to show any kind of achievement that society will accept. So that always worries me when we go down that um, path of say, Oh, so and so achieved this, so and so achieved that. It's not important. It's not important. The dignity of the person, in whatever in whatever state they are, um, is what I find sacred, precious, and important. Um, I understand that it's good to be able to say those things, but I think it's it's dangerous. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to have the floor. I'd just like to express the, uh, uh, with regard to what the lady had just said, there are many ways of accepting things. It doesn't mean that you do not accept a person's limitation, but trust me, that person wants to be able to do something, because dignity for that person is being able to feel that they can be useful or do something, you know, complete in society and. It's very interesting because I come across a situation in the Philippines where they've encouraged this child who had a lot of disability and she used her leg and her feet, literally her foot, to manage the computer. You know, she wanted to do something. The family accepted her limitation, but accepted the fact that she wanted to do something with her life. So she had a computer, she trained herself, she used it, she's done online, and she's working as an online person with a computer. So what does that tell us? It tells us that although there's a certain amount of acceptance to limitation, we respect the dignity of the person to want to do something with themselves, you know, to support that need. And obviously you have the situation of 
have been able to take care of herself and her needs because she tried. That's all I can say. Thank you. Can we just keep it to direct questions for the speakers, for maybe for Chris and Mary or whoever else? The discussion is great, but we could just have a question. Um, I used to teach students with learning disabilities, and sorry, this is a a, is a, bit, a, a bit of a comment and, and a question okay. involved as well. So. Uh, Two of my students became typists, um, used a copying machine. Um, one asked to be allowed to use my video camera to film what we were doing. Um, so m my question is, well, it's, a, it's kind of a question, why could we not, to inspire the group, why could we not have, at a, at a SPUC conference, why could we not have, um, sorry, this is in, in opposition to what the lady just said there. But they do have a desire to um, do something useful. So why in a SPUC conference we could we not showcase uh, on video, for example, people who have accomplished things such as, um, I've seen a comedian who had uh, no hands and I can't remember, I can't remember if he had feet or no legs or something, and he performed on a, um, on the stage, um, you know, I'm sure that, and I've seen a, um, a, a young Japanese girl play the piano when she had only um, fingers and thumbs, and she played, you know, classical pieces on the piano. So why couldn't we have videos of people like this? You, you take a snippet from this video and a snippet from that. I'm, I'm, I happen to be in front of television. You take um, a snippet from this film, a snippet from that, put it all together, and do a presentation at a SPUC conference um, to inspire people to understand that people with learning disabilities still do have a desire to achieve and to achieve something of worth to them. One of my students, when she was um, writing a report at the end of the day, and I gave her a little star on, on the page, she beat her chest and said, I'm so proud of myself. And I was floored, I was shocked that this little bit of, that she could write and write well and get a star for was so important to her that she felt so proud and that it made me feel so wonderful to give this tiny little skill to this person. Yeah. So that's what's called. Yeah, thank you, Jean. Thank you. Okay. that you've all been travelling a long time today and um, it was due to finish at 9.15, we did start a bit late, so I apologise for that. Uh, I just want to say in relation to these points we've been discussing in the question and answer session, what we, what we are saying, what SPUC is saying, is human beings, we're human beings, that's all that matters. The fact that you can do this or you can do that is great but it's because we're human beings, because we're members of the human race. That's why we are looking to protect you. Um, right, okay. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this evening. And it's given you some food for thought, time and, and food for discussion now over um, a lemonade or a soda <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> or as you're making your way back to bed, uh, and be ready for um, breakfast tomorrow morning. Uh, mm. There are service, services at 7.30 tomorrow morning for those who are interested, and then breakfast at 8.30. Um, and I'll see you all tomorrow. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.